We're going to talk about antibiotics, why we misuse them, whether we're running out, and whether we can achieve new generations of drugs. So let me set the stage a little. When I look out across this audience, I realize that just about everyone here was born within the antibiotic era, which starts either in 1928, when Sir Alexander Fleming notices that something that blew in his laboratory window is killing the plate of staph bacteria that it landed on, or in 1940, when the organism and the compound that it makes are turned into the first antibiotic, penicillin. So for all of us, antibiotics have always been there, and so we assume they always will be. And of course, that is not correct. Today, an estimated 700,000 people around the world die each year from drug-resistant infections, including 23,000 in the United States. That total is forecast to rise to 10 million deaths by 2050. And in addition, 2 million people in the United States are sickened each year by drug-resistant infections but survive at a cost of billions to the healthcare system, billions more in lost productivity and disability. And we're in this grim situation because antibiotic resistance is both an inevitable biological process, but also a phenomenon that we made worse by our casual behavior around these drugs, giving them for infections that they cannot affect, giving the wrong drugs, and giving them to livestock in all those situations risking the cost of antibiotic resistance without the benefit of curing disease. For most of the antibiotic era, the rise of resistance probably looked like a manageable problem, because for any drug that lost its effectiveness, there was always another one. That is no longer true. The pipeline of antibiotic development, which was once a gusher, is now a trickle. And it's common to hear people talk about the post-antibiotic era. And that phrase embodies not just the likelihood that infections will become fully drug-resistant, but also that there will be no new antibiotics to save the day. So that's due in part to the reality that, with pathogens, we are always engaged in asymmetric warfare. The math of production and reproduction favors them. It doesn't favor us. So over the decades, big pharma companies have decided, with what seems like reasonable logic to me, that the 10 years and billion dollars that it takes to bring a new compound to market cannot be recouped in the time that an antibiotic remains effective. And yet, in the past few years, policymakers have plunged into discussion of how to lure drug makers back into the antibiotic market again. And innovative scientists have begun to look for novel antibiotic compounds in the lab and in the natural world. And the two experts who are on stage with me are deeply involved in those efforts. So let's dive in. Kevin, I'll start with you. Let's talk about how we got to this point. Why is making an antibiotic so hard? I think the uh, antibiotic business model, the R&D model, is broken for two reasons. Um, I mean, think about the technology in your, in your phone, or for some of us on our wrist. It's more than, uh, than, than the technology that was used on the space shuttle, right? You know, it's amazing what we've done in terms of technology. But uh, imagine what it would be like to make these things if constants, like Planck's constant or the speed of light or an electron's charge, changed every once in a while. You know, it would be incredibly difficult to make those phones and that technology. Now you see what evolutionary biology does to our drugs. You know, technology that worked great in 1940 is now nearly obsolete because of evolution. The second problem is economics. Um, if you make a shiny, new, amazing phone, people line up to buy it, and you charge a premium price, and you sell as many as you can, and people celebrate it. Uh, if you make a shiny, new, amazing antibiotic, you put it behind glass, you say, break this glass only in the last possible use, and you sell it for you know, as little as possible because the hospital formulary committee pushes back. And, and for that reason, companies just can't make money. At the same time, we need to be doing this, this R&D because if we fail to, we have to continue to do R&D just to avoid falling behind. So economics and evolution are, are key problems in this area. So you represent one of the efforts 
to change this paradigm. Can you talk a bit about how this works? So I'm proud that, that Boston is a, is a leader globally in trying to work on R&D issues uh, for antibiotics. Carbex is funded by, by the U.S. government and by the Wellcome Trust. We have $455 million. Our goal is to look for small companies uh, that, are, that are coming in the valley of death. They have preclinical projects for which there's very little private capital for antibiotics and to help them develop a product and we're going to take them across that, those early stages, the preclinical stages, complete phase one, and then have them ready for a phase two trial, uh, which then can be funded. Uh, we have, you know, you showed on the list how few new antibiotic classes. The last time that, that the world discovered a new class of gram-negative antibiotics that was approved by the FDA, this is going to scare you, it's the year I was born. 1962 was the last discovery of a gram-negative that was approved by the FDA. We have already in our portfolio four companies uh, with new classes of gram-negative antibiotics. Most of it will fail. It's, it's, it's high-risk science, but that's the sort of risk return that we're trying to do at Carbex. So, Erica, um, I, I think the response to Kevin's project shows that there's a hunger in the industry to somehow break this logjam and move forward. And the Small World Initiative, which you had, is another response to trying to move new compounds into the pipeline. Can you talk about how that works? Yes, so through the Small World Initiative, we're basically replacing traditional microbiology courses with our discovery-based course at the high school and undergraduate levels. And through that, we're engaging students uh, to become student researchers and hunt for new antibiotics. So we actually have students going out, collecting soil samples, growing out the bacteria, isolating it, and testing for medically relevant um, antibiotic producers. And uh, over just the course of the last four years, we're in We've grown from a six-person class at Yale University to 235 schools in 38 U.S. states and 14 countries, and that involves thousands of students each year. Um, so we're setting forth this uh, crowdsourcing approach, and we think that through engaging so many students in this, we're, we're really able to, um, to to look at the problem from a side that the pharmaceutical industry hasn't been able to handle from, because it's really expensive to do this early discovery. And if you're having PhDs doing it in that way, it's very expensive. But if you're engaging students through an educational model, you're able to kind of tap into this um, different resource, which is really interesting. Uh, so right now, once the course ends, uh, there's... Um, chemical analysis that some schools continue to do on an individual basis. And we're developing uh, some additional things and fundraising for some additional things so we can kind of do the bridge between a program like ours and something like Carbex, which is more uh, middle stage uh, funding. So we're developing some additional modules where students can go on and do the chemical analysis and we're also fundraising for a central repository and chemical hub to do some of the additional screening. So, uh, I remember reading about the early days of antibiotic discovery, which commercial is the subject of the story I've written for The Atlantic next month. And in reading about the, um, the very first attempts to find antibiotics, it was the scientists of Pfizer, I think, who said that before they found their drug teramycin, which was an early tetracycline, they re-found streptomycin probably a hundred times. Mm -hmm. So, that... Um, that attempt to find things in the natural world was initially productive and then very repetitive, and maybe that's why the industry moved away. Mm -hmm. So how do you solve that problem? Is it, is it just that well, you have the brute force of s so many classes working on it? That's one thing, but it is true. So the, using traditional methods, there is a more than 99% rediscovery rate, which is why a lot of people thought, oh, we'll move to synthetic chemistry, that's the answer. But the fact of the matter is the vast majority of FDA-approved antibiotics come from soil bacteria and fungi, and there's only been two classes that have been approved from the synthetics. Mm. So it's not been all we thought it would be. It hasn't kind of delivered on the promises. 
On the same side, if you go back to looking at soil bacteria, uh, only about 1% is culturable under standard laboratory conditions. And it's estimate, there are some broad estimates over how many species actually you can find in one gram of soil. Um, the founder of the program, Dr. Handelsman, she estimates between 4,000 and 40,000 different species in one gram of soil. Uh, but other people have estimated it at millions. So it's obviously... a, a, a a very big range, but even if you're just looking at the thousands, that's so many different things to look at. So if you try different methods for isolating the bacteria and culturing it, you can kind of tap into that other 99% that we haven't had access to. And the theory goes that if the 1% produced um, some interesting medically relevant antibiotics, we'll have a similar um, help on the, with the other 99%. Uh, so that's one thing. And of course, if you're only looking at the 1% that's culturable, if you have a model like ours with thousands of students, even if it takes, you know, tens of thousands or so to find one or two interesting candidates, we have those numbers. Uh, so I think this model kind of works from a couple angles. So I'll ask both of you these questions. Is the, is the problem only that we don't have new compounds that will work, or are there problems further down the pipeline that are keeping us from moving these new compounds if they're found into uh, development and onto the market? Sure. So I think a big problem uh, with how people are responding to the antibiotic crisis is they've put money into middle and later stage, but they're not putting money into the discovery side of things. Mm -hmm. And that is greatly lacking. Uh, NIH, they really need to multiply that by at least 10 uh, on the discovery side to come up with the number of potential candidates we want to come up with each year. Uh, so I think that's that's the biggest um, lack is the lack of funding and discovery. Kevin, is your project yeah. solving this problem? So one of the questions at CarbX was, uh, are there really new classes out there that are worth investing in? Because you're right, uh, the private capital doesn't want to go into the early stages. Um, it, it's another way of saying, is, is all the low-hanging fruit picked and is it just going to be difficult? Uh, and I have to say that we at CarbX have been amazingly impressed with uh, the early stage products, teams, research that's out there. Um, we have some of the most experienced antibiotic drug developers in the world working for Carvax, uh, John Rex and Barry Eisenstein, and, uh, and they were shocked what we found when we put out the call for non-dilutive capital for early stage work. Uh, there's truly some amazing things out there. To say that another way, I think in the next panel, Tony Fauci is coming up, to say it another way, NIH, you know, NIH, NIAID, has actually been funding some interesting things that are now ready to move forward, but the companies can't get across the valley of death without some money to do this preclinical work. Can you explain what the valley of death is? So, so <laughs> the, the valley of death, uh, you know, for, for antibiotics is at a different stage. If you're an immune oncology company, there's private capital to do this preclinical work. For antibiotics, because of the business model is so broken, because it's so difficult to, to make any money in this, there's very little money to do the basic work of, of looking at, you might have a, a hit in, in, in 50 ideas, but you need to optimize that so that it's a product that actually is not going to be toxic to humans. You know, you have to move it through the preclinical stages. All of that takes time and money. And, and where is that money going to come from? So Carbex, we're not early discovery. We're, we're, we, we partner with the NIH. They're actually on our board. Uh, and, and we're not the late stage work. You know, we're not the phase two trials. We're trying to, to do the middle thing and to, to find a bunch of of interesting, novel, first-in-class sort of ideas and, and move them through so that hopefully private capital will be ready to fund their phase two trials. So uh, in a moment, we'll have questions from the audience, so please start thinking about what you want to ask these folks. I'll ask you one more question in the meantime. Um, assume that you could blow up the current discovery and development process. How would you rebuild it? What would the perfect process look like? Don't have a first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, I think the, uh, there's a lot of interesting money right now on what, what we call uh, push incentives. On, so NIH grants, CARBEX in Europe, IMI, the new drugs for bad bugs programs, things like that. Things to move things along. But unless we fix the business model at the end of the day, 
it's still going to be broken. So what's needed is something called a pull incentive. You know, and uh, you'll see this. There was a this last week uh, the Transatlantic Task Force on Antimicrobial Resistance, an intergovernmental group between the United States, Europe, and Canada, TATFAR, uh, published a, a study in CID on uh, uh, a, a comment calling for exactly this, that we need something dramatically different in the way that we pay for antibiotics. We can't pay for them based on volume, okay, because of resistance. That's what we did in the 50s, and look where it's gotten us. We have to pay for antibiotics based on their value to society, okay? And so there's, there's ideas. In, in the O'Neill report, some of the data that you put up, they call it a market entry reward. Uh, another phrase in this area is delinkage. They're talking about the same things. It's a, a different way to pay for antibiotics based on value. If I could only do one thing, I would change that because then the need for CARBEX might go away. Because you would, if you fix the end game, you fix the earlier stages too, I think. Erica, what do you think? I, I agree, and I think that's really critical. Uh, I, and there's also been different prize money type models that people have set up. Uh, I also think that it would be interesting to look at it as a type of lottery pool. So if you need all of these people to engage in solving the problem, because uh, it can't be solved by one person alone, no one has a monopoly on who will discover the next major uh, antibiotic, I think people should be rewarded just for participating mm -hmm. in the process. So I think that would be an, an, an interesting kind of novel way that people haven't uh, thought of uh, doing it. Uh, but I think that tapping into uh, I mean, you showed the statistic before from the review on antimicrobial resistance, the Lord O'Neill number of this exponential problem. Uh, and I think we need an exponential solution. So tapping into students, researchers across discipl different disciplines, not having people just working in their own silos. So really collaborating across disciplines is really critical and funding a way to do that. So funding uh, working groups and a leadership group around that. And some have come together, but it's still kind of siloed on um, the, the chemistry and biology side of things. Uh, so I think that would be interesting. And also looking at models that address the antibiotic crisis in other ways. So for something like Small World Initiative, it's not just trying to do discovery, but through that there's workforce development, so who's going to discover these antibiotics? There's um, scientific literacy, so does society understand this problem? How are we gonna change policy and, and funding mechanisms? So that's, a, that's something that's helpful. And also changing behaviors around uh, antibiotic resistance. I can't tell you how many students have said they've you know, changed how they use antibiotics and, and their prevention strategies. So that's kind of an unintended outcome, but it's very valuable in thinking about our approach. And we haven't even talked about the issue of stewardship of if we achieve new antibiotics, how do we change people's behavior around them? But let's hold that until we see if there are any questions in the audience. I believe there are one or two. Someone should speak. Okay. Yeah, I'm David Brazos, an anatomic and clinical pathologist. I'm just wondering if, in addition to the discovery, we could be using the currently existing technology to look for plasmids, et cetera, in the non-severely toxic patient who would always get triples, um, and find out exactly what minimum antibiotic can be used uh, when a patient uh, presents, rather than use empiric antibiotics. So you're talking, I think, about the problem of diagnostics, yes. right? You want to handle it? So, I mean, one of the most depressing things I read was a, a, story, a, a study from the 1950s saying that what we really need in order to use antibiotics more accurately is a better diagnostic. And, and, and here we are, you know, decades later, and, and physicians, clinicians still say, I'm in the, in the dark when it comes to, especially in those first couple of hours when a patient presents. So without a doubt, but, and that business model is broken for different reasons. And uh, you know, getting that together it would, be, would be an awesome improvement over what we have now. Hi, uh, Glenn Fennelly from Rutgers University. I'm actually a pediatric infectious disease specialist, so again, we, 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 we very much welcome the work you're doing. Uh, question, given the rules of evolution, isn't it only a matter of time, uh, given whichever antibiotics Carbex or your initiative is working on, will become resistant? Or perhaps there is something in the pipeline that you're working on that will be more resilient. And if these do come to market, you, the image of behind glass door is, I think, very important. It may have to remain there. Therefore, should these become even orphan drugs? 
Yeah. So, you know, if we, had, if we could wave a magic wand and cause every excellent heart disease drug that will ever be invented to appear tomorrow, we would. We would love to have them all instantly. And that's not true for antibiotics. We want to space them out and have a new class about every 10 or 20 years when we need them. And we do not want every antibiotic that's ever going to be discovered to be ready now because we'll be using them. So with, that's why I say we have to dramatically change the way we pay for it. And uh, there's some sort of a prize mechanism and then it goes behind glass because we can't just let it go to the market. We have room for one more question. Is there one? Yes, thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Isaac Stoner. I uh, am leading a new antibiotic development venture called Octagon Therapeutics. So we're one of the good guys. Uh, <laughs> so I uh, have a quick question just around uh, antibiotics in general. So I think with all these new Hep C classes, we've showed that, that curing disease can be good business. Mm -hmm. uh, but in antivirals is technically, or is usually narrow spectrum combination therapies versus broad spectrum single agents. Do you see antibiotics headed in that direction as well? Well, that's once again also kind of a question about diagnostics. Uh, so doctors treat uh, infections where they shoot first and ask questions later because there isn't enough time to know which one you should use in order to use a narrow class. So that's about putting funding into the diagnostic side of things so that you could use a narrow uh, antibiotic and reduce the evolutionary pressures um, that uh, make uh, broad spectrum antibiotics useless. Vega, say something quick about Hep C. Is that all right? Sure. So um, Hep C is is not as acute, right? So if somebody presents with a bacterial infection, they need to be treated immediately. Uh, hep C, you have a little bit of time, and the, and our diagnostics are a little better, so you know. Second thing about Hep C is that there wasn't, you know, a cheap generic alternative which worked almost all the time, you know, and so they get premium price, and 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 the companies have made gigantic gigantic fistfuls of money uh, on the hep C therapies. For antibiotics, you know, if you had a brand new amazing gram-negative antibiotic, you still need to price it to, to compete against empiric therapy, which for vancomycin, $120 per course of treatment, you know, so it's, if you don't have the diagnostic to say you need my super drug as opposed to vanco, uh, you can't, it's difficult to support a premium price. So very different markets, but you're right, hep C, the market works. Antibacterials, not so much. Did we, I think we had one more question, yes? Hi, my name is Joe Zarella. I work in the uh, state legislature here in Massachusetts. And I was just wondering, has the uh, 21st Century Cures Act affected your work at all in terms of R&D and expanding upon, you know, finding um, more effective uh, antimicrobials out there? I would say not much. Um, the, there, there are some proposals in Congress now being talked about in, in relationship to the PDUFA, the, the FDA reauthorization that's coming up this, uh, in these next few weeks, uh, to try to get some more specific things for antibiotics and federal legislation. Uh, nothing useful in 21st century cures specifically for, for antibiotics, nothing of great import. So lightning round, because we have just a couple of minutes left. Um, a couple of years ago, Zeke Emanuel said in an op-ed in, I think, the New York Times, that there's an easy solution to the problem of demand for antibiotics, and that is that we should price them like cancer drugs. <laughs> what do you think about that? Do you want to go first? I think that's really challenging because, first of all, people still consider um, these infections something that's remote, that, infect, that, that are problems for people who have another problem or are already at the end of life and things like that. So people aren't... Um, pricing it or thinking about it in a way that it could impact them. And I think that until the problem becomes an even bigger problem, unfortunately, and starts impacting a lot of uh, more young, healthy looking people in great numbers, because obviously it is now, but in the type of numbers that would spur people to action, that you couldn't do something like that. And also, um, as uh, Kevin had mentioned earlier, uh, there's just not that time frame to come to the realization over, you know, departing with making a decision in terms of that type of financial me metrics. With cancer, you have more time, uh, I think, to make those decisions. The uh, most expensive antibiotic in, in the history of the world is, is Avacaz. It's about $12,000 per course of treatment, maybe 10 after discounts. 
And, uh, and uh, what, how are its sales in its first couple of years? Well, not spectacular, you know. So, and that's the highest that they could go because of this issue that I, I mentioned about hep C, you know, in comparing, you know, the, the lack of diagnostic certainty on, on how, you're gonna, how are you going to know that you need this drug, you know. Because if you knew that this drug would save the life of a 30-year-old, you know, person, that drug would be worth a million dollars, right? But you don't know that, so it's harder. Second thing with, with premium pricing is that this is a global problem. If we don't fix this problem in China and India and Brazil, we haven't fixed it because those germs will come, you know, plasmids will transmit right back to the United States. And uh, so a premium pricing model has to think about how, how do you deal with the entire planet, not just well-insured Americans. Well, since you've raised the issue of the global south then super quickly, what does that mean for our um, for attempts to impose stewardship? How do we convince other places where antibiotics might be over the counter, might be very inexpensive, that they should start using them with the, the consciousness and deliberation that we want to see here? WHO has got a global action plan. Global, WHO has a lot of challenges in, in front of it. This is not their top priority. It probably should be. Right, I agree. The United Nations, they've had a lot of discussions around this. And I mean, people have committed to taking steps on that. It's a matter of time to see if they actually will. But once again, I see, if, I think that if you start seeing this exponential problem, uh, that you will see people take action in different ways and there'll be more pressure for countries to come along in that. That's a great way to end. Thank you so much. Thank you all.